Okay. It's going to be an exciting day. Look at those happy faces. Well, timing is everything, especially concerning the temple and holy days. You think timing is important with the Lord on yeah, some of his aspects? Yeah. I've come to believe over the course of time that God has set his calendar, his timeline, just like a perfectly synchronized clock in a computer. And I mean to the hour, to the minute. And we'll get a, a little feel for how quickly the Israelis figured this out. That God is very particular about timing and how you do things according to the temple. In Leviticus we have a a brief little scene here where Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, put incense on them, and offered strange fire before the Lord. In their heart, maybe their heart was in the right place, but it either wasn't the time or something else was out of whack because it says fire came forth and just consumed them, devoured them. So I think that was probably one of the first hints that the Israelis figured out, we better really follow to the letter whatever instructions were given. In Samuel, the Philistines had captured the ark, and finally the day came when the Philistines just could only take so much, and they sent the ark back. And so David goes out with an entourage and, and they go put the, the Ark of the Covenant on a cart and they're hauling it back. Everybody's all happy the Ark is coming back to Jerusalem. But Uzziah, while the Ark is going, could see that the Ark on the cart was wobbling a little. He stuck his hand out and just touched it. Boom, died right there. So the Lord, is, seems to like, is very picky about things that go in the temple, the temple area, and boom, when, when you're out of line enough, it's instant. So in our desire to be accurate concerning the calendar that the Lord instituted, let's jump into the calendar swamp. <laughs> like a real swamp, there are perilous hazards, dangers, warnings, and malevolent entities. Ken Johnson has just uh, recently released a book, 2020, I believe, small little book, and, and Teresa's right, we are living in such a wonderful time where they are excavating Israel, and uh, even recently I was looking at on Christianity Today, and uh, they have found new stuff just this last year, and they are, uh, they've been pulling 42 pieces of documents out of the jars that they find in the caves. And they found another cave, and um, it's just uh, really interesting to see this information come out. I remember I was talking to a guy one day, and he said, if it's not King James, I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. And I thought, if you were investigating history, you would get your hands on every book you could that might have some relevant information. And King James has its problems. It's a majestic book, but did you know that because King James paid the money to have the book written, he modified, he told the scribes, I'm gonna want you to modify this particular word. 
We call it church today. It used to be ecclesia, God's ruling body. These would be the godly men that would be at the gates of the city. So, it would be wise to be looking for all the scraps of information we could get because we're living in a time when I think it's really going to be important. Now, Ken states in his book um, a lot of interesting things he's pulled together. And I think... Uh, He's got some really good points that we'll see as we go along. But there is one particular area that you'll see I kind of have an issue with pretty soon here. The historian Josephus records that the Essenes existed in large numbers and thousands of them lived throughout Roman Ju Judah but they were fewer in number than the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the other two major sects of the time. And they did have, appear to have a very large quantity of documents that fortunately for us were sealed up and preserved in weatherproof containers. The researchers have collected 982 different manuscripts in 1946 and 47 out of 11 caves dated as early as the 8th century BC and as late as the 11th century AD however they've been finding caves in 2017 <coughs> and 2021 in February 2017, the Hebrew University archaeologist announced the discovery of a new 12th cave. In March of 2021, they discovered dozens of fragments bearing biblical texts written in Greek from the book of Zechariah and Naaman. The particular group of findings are believed to have been hidden in a cave 132 to 136 AD during the Bar Kokhba revolt. <coughs> the Essenes were expecting the soon coming Messiah. They believed the Messiah was coming. And they expected him to be killed, just as the scripture said. Lucky for us, they kept diligent records and hid them away in weatherproof containers. There's plenty of online news if you want to find more things out on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Christianity today carries a number of things up to date, but there's a lot of other uh, archaeological sites that you can check into. So now back to the calendar. Shouldn't the calendar be the same today as it was back to at least the time right after the flood. You would hope that once the flood was over they'd get a handle on the calendar or Noah would have brought one forward and we would just all be using that today. I would have expected them to figure out the calendar really pretty early in mankind's history because it is a tremendous requirement if you're growing crops. If you plant your crops too soon, the frost gets them. You don't want to plant them too late or they won't mature by the time the frost comes in the fall. So calendars are far more important to the agricultural community than it is to us today when we just go out and we buy whatever we need at Walmart superstores or the supermarket. So if the world is thought, as many do, that things today are just like they were thousands and thousands of years ago, that's known as the doctrine of uniformity, called uniformitarianism. 
which is highly regarded by some geologists, evolutionists, all fairy tale authors, and most PhDs. And that is just that everything has been this way forever. Charles Dahlrun thought that that was the case. Life has just been like this forever. We don't have to worry about the calendar as far as planting because we're able to just go down to Whole Foods whenever we want and get fresh peaches or oranges or whatever. We just, in our daily lives, normally don't have to think about that in a critical way. However, I came to rain on the uniformitarianism parade today and to bring you another perspective, which is not a fairy tale, and it's called catastrophism. Catastrophism theorizes that the Earth has largely been shaped by sudden, short-lived, violent events. You see, if everything has been the same for thousands of years, the calendars would tend to be very similar all over the world. The years, the seasons, months, but they aren't. And as you look at history of calendars, it's evident some issue has forced there to be calendar mod modifications to civilizations all over the earth. Now, if you go outside and just look around at the stars at night, you know, on a good uh, dark evening, could you pick out a planet or other special heavenly feature just, you know, if you didn't have a heads up about it? Could you just walk out? I'll bet most people couldn't just walk out and go, well, there's Jupiter there and, and there's Mars over there. Oh, that's Mercury. You know, we, we don't have to deal with those because they're not that important to us. Ancient cultures, though, named their gods, months, days, week, and temples after them. For some reason, they were far more interested and affected by these things. Which just doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it. How could this stuff that's so far away from us have an impact where you decide, hey, let's do a government project and build a gigantic temple here. There's just some, something amiss here. Now there's a great book that addresses this in detail. It's called The Long Day of Joshua. If you ever find one for under $50, grab it. It's actually worth a lot more. It's hard to find this book for a reasonable price. This book was written by three scientists. One of them taught orbital mechanics at Harvard and MIT. Another one was a programmer that worked for uh, John Hopkins University and developed programs for the Navy for their satellite system. And the other fellow is an author for books and lecture. So they're fairly sharp guys. And as time went along, they noticed that there was something rather unusual about catastrophes in the Bible. They're all Christians. When they were looking at the frequency of the dates, they came to the conclusion that there was a pattern. That things were not just random. And when they looked at the data that Mars may have had a different orbit thousands of years ago and crossed Earth's or orbital path. Actually, the slide before that. Oh, man, technology is not perfect. There is a slide missing there that was there this morning. <laughs> 
and it shows the dates of all sorts of events in the Bible. Noah's flood, the days of Peleg, where the earth cleaved, Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, Exodus, the long day of Joshua, Hezekiah, when they got up one morning, 185,000 Assyrians were dead. Isaiah, Habakkuk. And as they looked at those dates, they came to the conclusion that these were on a semi-regular clockwork system. They weren't just random out there. That's it. And so going back, the top is Noah, and as you go down to the bottom, they've got Mark, different places, and the last one was Hezekiah in 701 BC. Now the Earth-Mars orbit, as they were examining this data, they finally came to a conclusion that and it must have been shocking for them, but it turns out that they believe that Mars' orbit was shaped like that, where it would actually cross the Earth's orbit twice a year, possibly. That's kind of interesting, because it opens a Pandora's box here for us. They took the data, they put it in a computer, and they ran simulations with the dates of the catastrophes against worldwide events, not only just the stuff in the Bible, but they were looking at other things. Because there's legends and historical information. Before Rome was built, they had another capital city over there, and it was demolished by something. And they relocated, and they put Rome um, miles away from the edge of the ocean when they established Rome. Why would you do that? Usually you, you want, when you're establishing a city, you want it close to the edge of the ocean for all kinds of commerce. But they deliberately put the city away from the edge of the ocean there. The simulations as they ran them over the course of time showed that Mars came very close to the Earth. 70,000 miles twice and 60,000 miles once. Now, to give you perspective, the Moon is 238,000 miles and 900. It came within a quarter of the distance of the Moon to the Earth. It would generate 600 foot tsunamis might be why you set your city back from the edge of the ocean. And we're not aware of it, but there's actually every single day on planet Earth, there's a crustal tide from the moon of two to three inches. The moon's got that much gravitational pull, it makes the crust of the Earth move a little. But back when Mars would have come by in those close passbys, the crustal tides were 85 feet tall. That would be hard on great big walls around a city. Starts explaining things that were rather odd. Think of Jericho, and the walls came crumbling down. If you had a situation where the whole city base was moving 85 foot, I could see where that would stretch a lot of building blocks. As Mars would have come over the top of the North Pole on the long day of Joshua, it would have seemed like it was 50 times larger than the moon. And 100 times brighter because the reflectivity of Mars is much brighter than the moon is in the first place. And it's accompanied with meteors and bolides. Do you know what bolides are? Okay, meteors, 
big hunk of rock, iron, nickel, you know, pretty well cooked out in space, when it hits, it's just like a big heavy rock. A bolide, on the other hand, is a conglomeration. It's sort of like a rock, but it's got either ice in it or ammonia frozen in it. It's a chemical composition. And there's actually been several of them recorded. In Tunganuska, Russia, in 1908, one came over the land. It didn't hit the land, but it was either 3 to 30 megatons of TNT. It was like a nuclear weapon. It flattened 80 million trees over an area of 830 square miles. And you can actually see one of these. Someone caught it on video. Chelyabinsk meteor in Russia in 2013. And when it exploded in the atmosphere, it was equal to 400 to 500 kilotons of TNT. And it was a bolide that came in at a very shallow angle and blew up before it hit the ground. But when you look at it on YouTube, it shattered all the windows in the city. It was a tremendous uh, moment for them, out of the blue. And they didn't see it coming on radar. Now when a planet, when we look at planets and we think about planets in, in movies and TV shows, we just think, well, there's a the planet there and there's nothing around it. But it turns out that's not true. Planets, back one, planets have all kinds of debris floating around them. They pick up junk in space. Their gravity picks up stuff that comes by, it goes into orbit. So when you have a planet come nearby another planet, the gravity shifts and you get no shortage of meteors and bolides. And if you think about the long day of Joshua, when that took place, it says the, what fell out of the air, the meteors, killed more of the enemy than the Israelis killed. That's pretty wild. Yeah. It's kind of like a smart bomb, you know, it knows where to hit. <laughs> okay, next slide. So there's a little bit of a relationship size-wise, Earth to Mars. Mars is about a third of the size of Earth. And it's very interesting that both planets have an extremely similar axis tilt that they spin on. That implies they had some sort of history with each other. In fact, I think as they've looked at the other planets, there's a disturbing thing that bothers some of the uh, astrophysicists. Um, it looks like the planets came in pairs because they have similar rotation in pairs. Mars does have the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. Its size is the size of Arizona and 16 miles high. 16 miles high. Something squeezed Mars. There's been some tremendous effects when you look at the surface. That gouge across Mars is 2,800 miles long and 10 miles deep. It's a rough world out there in the cosmos. Okay, so that, that's an interesting theory as these, these guys came up with. But it's just a theory. We would really like to have some evidence that would back the theory up and give it, you know, some footing of rational, yeah, this, this may have really happened. They've already established that their orbital pattern matched biblical and world disasters. So the first place that we get some evidence, and, and I think God is so humorous, do 
many of you remember years ago on the news, they said they found a rock from Mars in Antarctica, I think it was. And it was just all the buzz because they were looking at it under the microscope and they were saying, see, this proves there's life on Mars. Because we can tell that the chemistry was just right. You know, it, the evolutionists are striving for anything to get rid of God. NASA is striving for money for their projects. So they were right on board. And now JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, that is heavily involved with NASA for the design of their rockets, says that they have found 126 meteors that have been identified as originating from planet Mars. What's really odd about that is the sun puts out something called solar wind. It's pushing outwards. And if you look at a uh, diagram of the electromagnetic field around planet Earth, it's pear-shaped, but the long part is facing away from the sun because that solar wind pushes things. <coughs> So for those rocks to get from Mars to us would be against the wind the whole way to get here to Earth. But if they were swinging by on the planet Mars and you had a lot of traumatic things happening on Mars, it might make sense that we had chunks landing on Earth. It happened that Chuck Missler years ago when he would go to Israel was chatting with Dr. Asher Kaufman at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and they were having a problem reconciling uh, the first temple and Herod's temple and they could not figure how they had got the first temple so wrong because it's imperative that the temple faced perfectly east. But they found it, the two temples were off by about five degrees. And they just couldn't reconcile it. And uh, Chuck Missler actually related to him this idea that these scientists had come up with. And that really caught the guy's eye. He goes, well, that would make some sense. And then there's one more, astronomical discoveries and dates. So the telescope was invented in 1609 by Galileo. And in 1610, he discovered four moons of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn. Sir William Herschel in 1781 discovered Uranus. And he also discovered some moons and moons on Saturn. Now in 1877, Asa Hall, using a brand new telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory, made astronomical history. He finds out Mars has two moons. This actually was shocking to the scientific world because they had seen Mars for a long time but nobody had ever seen any moons. And the reason was, the moons are extremely small, and one of them is named Phobos, which means fear. The other one that's about half the size is called Deimos. It means dread and panic. Phobos is the darkest object in the solar system. It has a reflective albedo of only 3%. It looks like a piece of coal, like it's been burned. So, so that was 1877 when Ace of Hall made that discovery. Now let's go back to 1726. This is 150 years earlier. 
Jonathan Swift released a third book that he was publishing with four voyages of Gulliver's Travels. He was an Irish political satirist, and he always liked to poke fun at England. And in his book, talking about the Little Puchins, they were saying how the English astronomers didn't know that Mars had two moons. 150 years, but one years before they really knew. They talked about the new moon, these moons, and described them in terms of Kepler's laws in this book he wrote. There's virtually no chance that Jonathan Swift knew that there were two moons. But he must have had access to myths or old records, and he likely assumed they were just legends and used them to add color for his satire. He never probably thought that what he was reading were eyewitness accounts from long ago. And in order for those two moons to be seen from Earth with the naked eye, they would have had to have been around 70,000 miles away. Now just consider those things as we're moving forward here. Today, many modern nations were using the Gregorian calendar. It was introduced in 1582 by Pope Gregory VIII. A minor modification to the Julian calendar was just reduced the average year from 365 and a quarter days to 365.2425. <laughs> but it had become a problem. The Julian calendar, which he modified, gets off a day every 128 years. The Romans changed the start of the year around, that had been around March 25th, to January in 4 BC. So prior to 4, 45 BC, the, the spring, the new year, started in March. The ordinary year in the previous Roman calendar considered of 12 months for a total of 100 and, or 355 days. In addition, a 27 or 28 day intercalary month was sometimes inserted between February and March. So they put it at the end of the year, so to speak. Many ancient calendars had 360 days. Most were roughly 12, 30-day months until 701 BC and they started changing. Hezekiah had them start changing the calendar after 701. The Romans added a few days and the Greeks they had a 354-day lunar calendar. And they changed New Year's Day from spring to fall. They calculated the months not by solstices or equinox, but by the lunar moon. And they added a leap month every three years. Many other civilizations and countries did the same sort of thing. It got very convoluted after 701 BC. However, you'd hope the Israelis of all the people would have kept it straight. Whatever was going on, because after all, the calendar was extremely important in their worship. So looking at a couple scriptures here, Daniel chapter 2, 21, he, speaking of the Lord, changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He changes. He, actu he actually changes. And I just 
notice this when I was doing this study. God actually changes. In Daniel 7, speaking about the Antichrist, he shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law. It never does say any place that I could find that he actually gets to do it. He thinks about it. And they, and we were talking about two things here. He's wearing out the stain, saints and he's thinking about changing the times. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and a half. My question is, is he talking about both items? Is he talking about just wearing out the saints? Because we know he does that. Or does he really get to change times eventually? Kind of a little blurry there. So we can keep in mind, now that we plainly know, that Satan desires to change times, to meddle with the calendar. If you think about it, how bizarre is that? What does it matter to him? Other than, you know, yeah, I can get the Jews off of worshiping the right day. I mean, that's kind of a lot of work to get something like that messed up. But apparently it's important to him. Now it's rather interesting that there are several ancient prophecies concerning the nation of Israel as it relates to their calendar. In the book of Enoch, in the ancient book of Jubilees, these books that are now coming out from the Dead Sea Scrolls. On that day, the night decreases to nine parts, and nine parts night, and the night is equal to the day. So that's talking about the equinox. The year is exactly 364 days long. Now that's kind of interesting. You know, we don't know over the course of man's history what the years were because if you had Mars coming around, the days of the year could have been adjusted a half a dozen times back before the days of Noah or around the days of Noah. But it's interesting in Enoch, it pins down. There's 364 days in a year. And, and this is from uh, the book of Jubilees. And command thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days. And these will constitute a complete year. And they will not disturb its time from its day and from its feasts. So we have that warning. Then in the ancient book of Jubilees, there's a warning. For there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon, how it's disturbed through the seasons, and cometh in from year to year ten days too soon. For this reason, the years will come upon them when they will disturb the order and make the abominable day the day of testimony, and an unclean day, a feast day, and they will confound all the days, the holy and the unclean, and the unclean day with the holy, for they will go wrong as to the months, and Sabbaths, and feasts, and jubilees. For this reason I commanded testifying to thee, that thou mayst testify to them, for after thy death, thy children will disturb them, so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason, they will go wrong as to the new moons and seasons and the Sabbaths. Ancient book of Jubilees. So with these things in our background, now consider the following. Antiochus Epiphanes. Everybody's favorite guy, the fourth. 
Antiochus Epiphanes IV inspired the Jewish Maccabees to revolt. And they drove out the Greeks for a time around 168 to 169 BC. Antiochus marked, marched on Jerusalem, shoo, slew Jesh, Jason, the last Zadok high priest, to serve in the temple, and dedicated the temple to Zeus, erecting an image of Zeus in his own image. I had never noticed that before. <laughs> Sounds like a time in the future. Erected that in the temple and sacrificed a pig on the altar. After his death, Antiochus V made a deal with the Maccabees. They could keep their religion, but they had to pay tribute and use the Seleucid Empire calendar. That's that Greek calendar that uses the lunar signs. The Maccabees accepted the offer. They had no issue with using a different calendar. Smells like sulfur to me. <laughs> Sounds like demonic mischief. If we believe the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is the true origin of the modern Jewish calendar. The Zadok priest said that giving up the original solar calendar alone would be a grievous sin. Eventually, they were driven out and settled in Qumran. And they took copies of everything in the temple library. Then John Hyrcanus I, a priest during the Maccabee era, around 134 to 104 BC, took the title of high priest and king. The Jews who felt that they should follow the high priest no matter what he says became known as Sadducees. Even though none of them were Zadok priests, they took their name from the Zadok priestly line. The remaining true Zadok priests were in Qumran at this time. Priests who wanted to follow the Mosaic law refused to support these high priests and they became known as Pharisees. By 96 to 88 BC, there was all-out war between the two factions. The Dead Sea Scrolls say that at this time all of Israel was walking in madness. These factions kept rising up and were in constant turmoil with each other. And finally, the Romans had enough of it. And they appointed Herod and Idumean as king of the nation, hoping that it would calm things down, but it never did. And the nation was dissolved in 135 AD. The Dead Sea Scrolls describe how God created the calendar and that the Jews kept it pure until when the Greek Seleucid Empire forced the nation to adopt their pagan lunar calendar. <coughs> if the Essene history is correct, Israel has been using a forbidden pagan version of the calendar for well over 2,000 years. But for the first time in 2,000 years, the calendar can be reestablished, utilizing information from the Essene and other ancient records. It turned out the months used to be numbered 1, 2, 3, to 12. And the days were 1 through 6, but the seventh day was the Sabbath. And this is represented when you read the scripture. And here's some examples. In John, on the third day, a wedding took place in Canaan. Jesus and his mother were there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. What day was it? Tuesday. 
because they got their tip off from when God created everything. He started on Sunday. Monday didn't get any blessing, but Tuesday is a day of double blessing. And you want to get every bit of help you can get. <laughs> In Exodus, the Lord's telling Moses, this is the beginning of months for you. It shall be the first month of your year. But I'm assuming it was implied. They knew when the Passover was. They knew it was the first month of the year. But it never did define what the first day was. Perhaps as they're finding more manuscripts, that will be clearly defined. Was it on the equinox, spring equinox? Or was it related to the spring equinox? The Essenes maintain the first day of the year on the calendar should always be the fourth day of creation. So what day is that? Wednesday. And their reasoning is this. In Genesis 1.14, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to distinguish between the day and the night, and let them be signs to mark the seasons and days and years, and let them serve as lights in the expanse of the sky upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars as well. And God saw it was good. And there was evening and morning the fourth day. A Wednesday. But if you look at day one, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Have you ever thought about what that first day must have been like? I mean, really try to put that in a model of understanding. We have light, but the earth isn't there with anything yet. You couldn't use a sundial on that day. No point of reference. So that's why they picked the fourth day, because on that day you could use a sundial. And, and I thought about that first day a number of times and, and have wondered, was it sort of like, have you been in a thick fog that was so thick, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face almost? You know, you couldn't drive in it, but fog can get pretty thick. Now it wouldn't have been moist like a fog, but God, did he just make a whole bunch of what a physicist would call light. And it was just everywhere. And I did see one uh, discussion where they were trying to come to grips with the physicists are having a rougher time as the year goes go by. They were trying to figure out what is it that makes up the subatomic particles that makes the atom. And one fella was arguing it's all made of light. All the subatomic particles are made somehow out of bundles of light. And I thought that that could be interesting to follow that line of thinking. Once God gave the Israelis the information to follow the accurate calendar, they likely used a sundial. And that's the one the Essenes were supposed to have used. And I believe that this is just a re recreation, that it's not one they actually dug up. And when you think of a sundial, how many of you think size-wise? You know, is a sundial like this far across? It turns out, and you find out in this book from the fellows, uh, that wrote this. In Jerusalem, 
they had a sundial that the king used. And you remember there was a time when the prophet comes into the king and he says, Hey, would you like the sundial to go forward 10 degrees or back? And you're thinking, well, that's kind of interesting. But in your mind, you're probably thinking, well, there's a little sundial. You know, we've seen these pictures, little sundial. The sundial was 60 feet tall where the pole was. That's how you get accuracy. You have a, a particular area that people don't get in. It's, it's got to be perfectly flat. And the bigger it is, the more accurate you could, you could see the hours go by. With the Essene calendar, that was the, go back to that one for just a moment. You can see on the Essene uh, sundial that they could tell very clearly um, end, end of the length of the year with the solstices, uh, the summer solstice, that's the one that's got the longest shadow, uh, the winter solstice uh, toward the end of December has got the shortest, and the other two are spring and fall equinoxes. So now to Stonehenge, when you think about what it would take to use a sundial, and you look at some of these ancient monuments, and they're around the world, really large monuments, and the scientists nowadays would tell us, well, they put these up for some of their rituals, but it's obvious it was very important for them to find the summer solstice, or the winter, or the equinoxes, that's what it was all about, and I'm thinking, Perhaps with an elaborate one, when Mars is headed your way, if you had the rock set up right, you might well be able to determine, is it going to be a close flyby this year, or is it going to be far away from us and not be a big issue? Because it turns out that in ancient days, the kings would consult with the astrologers, and the soothsayers and ask, is it a good year for war? And what, you know, when you read some of that stuff in the history, you wonder, how in the world would they know? What could an astrologer tell you if everything had been the same all this time? How could an astrologer tell you that, hey, it's a great year to go to war, the walls are going to fall down? And if you had some mechanism that could give you a heads up, because it turned out in the orbit of Mars, every two years it was back around again. It wasn't way, way out there for 20 years. It was out there for two years and it was on its cycle. Every two years it was exactly half of what the Earth was. And some years it would miss you completely. And as they ran the models, They've got the distances for every year, for a lot of years in here, of how far away it was. When it did come close to Earth, a lot of times it was half a million miles away. But as there's a wobble in the orbits, there were times when it would come really close. And I'm guessing that they had figured this out by the time a few of them had gone by, because you can see it coming. It, it's not all black. The sun's shining on it you could see, and it would be sort of like a very sliver of the moon as it approached. And when you look at the examples, and it, it's amazing how much scripture is in this book, where it talks about how the Lord sends Isaiah up to look from the rooftop at night. I think these people were very savvy that something comes around and that they could see some of this. But when it passes between the earth and the sun, most of it would be black. You just see a little edge of it. And so people who are watching and had a mechanism to see right where the angles were as it came, I th I'm guessing that these uh, astrologers could actually give the kings a reasonable chance that the walls were going to come down. You just needed to camp around the city because when the walls fell, you could just walk right in. Work for Jericho. Remember 
Jonah, goes to Nineveh. He's there at the same time Habakkuk is up in northern Israel giving one for to the king up there. Jonah's up at Nineveh, and he goes in and he, to the city. He goes, in 40 days, it's over for you guys. If they had astronomical ability and were watching these things, you could all at once understand why the king said, well, get on our knees, get sackcloth on, keep the food from the animals. It was serious. They had a memory of what happens. And if you saw something coming your way, I'll bet the king was then talking to the astrologers. Does it look like a bad year? Yeah. Might be good to humble, humble ourselves this year. Just interesting that, you know, you could have a real simple sundial, but they built these monstrosities. Well, let's look at a modern Jewish calendar. If you look at the calendar from year to year, it seems to me it's kind of way off base. Up in the upper left corner there, it has when the start of the current Jewish New Year is. It varies all over the place from late October to September by quite a bit. And I'm sure some of that has to do with seven times in a 19-year period, they insert a 30-day month. Imagine how that makes your day swing. I smell sulfur again. Okay, the Talmud has a recording of the high priest up to the destruction of the first temple. There were 18 high priests during the 400 years that the temple of Solomon stood. So on average, each priest served 22.2 years. However, during the 420 year period of the second temple, there were over 300 high priests. And the Talmud records this. The few, first few righteous high priests served many years. But after them, the Talmud says, after the righteous priests, the last 300 did not live past one year passing through the veil. Seems like something changed compared to the original temple. The Essenes believe that their calendar was sacred going back to the days of Adam and called themselves sons of light. They made numerous comments about the Pharisees' corrupted lunar calendar and called them the sons of darkness. So now we're going to look at the Essene calendar. And for those that are interested, Ken Johnson has put this calendar out on the internet. You can look at it any time from your cell phone or our computer. All of the days on the scene calendar for a month are 30. Every month. Every year, the year starts on Wednesday. That would be very handy. You'd always know what day of the week you were going to have Passover and all the other feasts. But it's not always on the first day as far as an equinox, which is what there's a lot of hint that equinox may have been the starting point. The scene year slide is the next one. And this is how they viewed the entire year. And the vertical and horizontal line they call the Tekufa, which is an equinox or a sol solstice. And the days in between are three months. They always add up to exactly 90 days. And it, may, and it accounts for a calendar with exactly 364 days. 
Now, I think it's interesting that that calendar would lend itself perfectly to a 360-day calendar if you just took out the Tekufas. You wouldn't have to change the layout. You just have to know that, oh, there's 360 days, we'll skip the Tekufas. These scenes would track the extra days accumulated in a 365 and a quarter day year, and they can add a leap year at the end, but they would always add a full seven days so that they would not get the seven day week cycle out of whack. This method will keep the calendar correctly for approximately 20,806 years in theory. Next slide. Oh. Should be one that says leap year. Nope. So anyway, when they do a leap year, they had a whole seven days. With their method, they start on Wednesday, but the trigger for the year is the spring equinox. That way they're never off by more than three days. Now that Jesus has come and he is our Passover lamb, and the veil of the temple has ripped from top to bottom, is there still a risk for high priests entering the Holy of Holies? If you've got a three-day window, you know, I would think that they'd really want to hammer down this calendar perfect before the first high priest walks back into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood. And will they find the real ark and put it in the Holy of Holies? Aside from the previous issues, we are, are we confident that the count of the years has been kept correctly? Is it really the Jewish year 5781? As Ken went through the research, he found in the Seder Omen that we're off by 165 years. We are far closer to the 6,000 year mark. The Seder Omen was written to preserve the true history in its day and bring to light the attempt of certain rabbis to change dates in history. It describes a rabbi named Yose, Y-O-S-E, who modified the calendar more than once, deliberately modifying Daniel chapter 9, concerning the time of Messiah's first coming. And the changes are in the current Jewish calendar. I smell sulfur in. To add to the soup of the day, we have two scriptures that mirror each other in the New Testament. For in those days there will be much tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the day. Days, plural, excuse me. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but sometimes in scripture, the verbs are interesting. Speaking of future tense, as he's talking here, he shortened past tense, the days. You'll find that in a number of prophetic words that, and even when Jesus was talking, he gave a prophecy, but if you look at the verbs, it's like he's talking from the future looking back. God is omnipresent, everywhere at once, in all times. As we behold the book of Revelation, we will see that we're headed for a time of global heavenly interaction. 
that the world has not seen for eons. But that's okay, because Luke 21 tells us, Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And the times they are a changing indeed. There are a lot of uh, manuals coming out from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I would recommend, you know, for those that want to dig deeper, mm -hmm. there's more. We are very fortunate that this stuff is coming out. And I think it, it's interesting, this book was released in 1973. I don't know if they met made a, a second printing, but it's a rare enough book. If you ever see one for under 50 bucks, snag it. You can turn around and sell it for a lot more. <laughs> I've seen them go on the internet as high as $6.99. When I first was looking, I thought, not in my realm, and uh, patience pays off. But that book will definitely give you a new perspective on what the commentators would call flowery uh, language that the prophets use. Because in the scripture it talks about how the hills are undulating. And they go through all the scriptures, a lot of scripture in there, mm -hmm. where the prophets of the day, when these events of the Mars interaction was happening, that make you rethink Wow, they were literally watching this happen. Water would stop and not flow down the stream. It, it's really a, a twist of our perspective. And I'm hoping that as the time goes on here that enough information will come out that the rabbis in Israel and the priests will connect someday and finally go, wow, we've got to fix this calendar, it's an issue, and perhaps by the time the new temple's built, there will be a new calendar that they run with. All things coming our way. So we can close here. Well, Father, we thank you so much that you are releasing information as your word said to Daniel, that Toward the time of the end, knowledge will abound and increase in, in all areas, spiritual and, and physical. Lord, we thank you so much that you have chosen us to be in this time period, to see things that the prophets long to see. And we do love up, Lord, because we do believe that you are coming back and our redemption does draw nigh. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.